Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Very happy to welcome to the event space Mr. Eli Infante. Eli, how are you today? I'm doing good, man. Just trying to stay cool. Like I was telling you earlier, we're looking at like 105 degree weather here in South Texas. So trying to stay inside. <laughs> I, I hear you. You know, we, we spoke about that before. We're, we're, we're a couple degrees cooler here. So, you know, if, if you get too hot over there, I'll send a, I'll send a limo. <laughs> you can get here in a couple weeks. Yes. <laughs> um, to everybody joining us, thanks for joining us. Eli's going to be talking about off-camera flash portraits and making those easy for you. So get really excited about that. I do want to go ahead and thank our sponsors for this event, Westcott. So thank you very much to them. Uh, if you do have any questions for Eli, please feel free to get him in. If you're joining us here on Facebook or Vimeo, you can go ahead and use the comment section. And if you're joining us here on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab. But otherwise, I want to say thank you again to Eli and Westcott for being here. And I'm going to hand over the reins to you. All right. Well, Scott, thank you guys for having me as well as uh, b &H and also Westcott. So let me go ahead and set this up really quick. I'm gonna go screen two, we're gonna share right over here and slideshow. Scott, can you just give me a thumbs up if this is showing up? This is a, this is a verbal thumbs up. Perfect, sounds good. All right guys, so we're gonna go ahead and rock and roll. We're gonna go ahead and start here. So we're gonna, I'm gonna be talking about off-camera flash using high-speed sync and also using ND filters. I'm gonna show you various ways where you can get shallow depth of fields, but how do we make this, uh, Easy up an easy process if you're new to off-camera flash. So a little bit of a little bit about me. I'm from South Texas. I'm talking like deep South Texas, about nine hours away from Dallas, about ten hours give or take. So it all depends. Uh, I'm a full-time teacher, so I teach photography and video uh, to high school students. I've been doing off-camera flash since about 2016, and my major, how I got into this whole photography stuff was through Photoshop. When I was a senior in high school, um, got into graphic design. So I dabbled into graphic design and Photoshop before I became a photographer. I am a Westcott Top Pro and I wake up early in the morning. My girlfriend hates me for it. <laughs> I wake up at 4.30 in the morning. That's how I get my work done to balance out how am I doing photography, YouTube and school or my full-time job. And so waking up early is really the only time I can really um, be able to edit pictures, edit my videos and get all my content out. So as I mentioned, I am an educator. So what, where this all began was when I was teaching, they were always asking me, Eli, can you photograph the sports teams, volleyball, basketball, baseball, softball, powerlifting, you name it. I had to start somewhere. I knew nothing about off-camera flash at that time. Um, and so this is one of my favorite photographs to show <laughs> because this was my pretty much my first experience using off-camera flash. Horrible results. I had no idea what I was doing. Completely embarrassed when I took this photograph and came back home. And I don't want anybody to go through that. Um, but we've all started somewhere, right? And so I still remember to this day looking on YouTube how to fix an overexposed photograph <laughs> using like over three or five different filters trying to get it to even look decent but this was the final results right <laughs> but this was uh, something that you know I hope after today's presentation you will not experience so here's my uh, current work now thankfully <laughs> and so this is kind of like my style I love shallow depth of field portraits using off-camera flash outdoors and so I'm gonna to try to break this down as easy as possible for you guys. So on the agenda, I'm gonna be talking about, well, why do I use off-camera flash? Why not use natural light? What is it specifically about off-camera flash that I enjoy so much? 90% of my work involves high-speed sync. There are other ways that you can do shallow depth of field portraits like using ND filters, but how does all that stuff work? What is all that terminology? What is all the technical stuff? We're gonna break that down. Then the common question I get on Instagram is the ambient exposure and the flash exposure. How am I able to balance out the strobes with the ambient to get natural looking results? And then at the very end, I'm gonna break down some of my favorite photographs and kind of give you a little bit of mindset as to how I'm composing my photographs and how am I lighting those pictures. So why off-camera flash? 
I love off-camera flash because I can capture these beautiful dramatic skies in the background, get these beautiful blue hour, like uh, golden hour colors in the sky while still retaining all of that detail. I also love using color gels. Sometimes I'll get into a scene and it'll be completely dark in that studio, but they have some interesting backgrounds, but I wanna bring that to life. Well, this is where I can introduce some speed lights, maybe an FJ200 with some color gels, and I can create a scene out of nothing. And so all of these uh, photographs that you see here were all used by using either high-speed sync or the Westcott strobes that I'm gonna be talking about. So before we begin, you know, there's a couple of things that you obviously need in order to create these pictures. First off, you're gonna need some type of strobe, whether that's a speed light, maybe a 200 watt strobe or a 400 watt strobe. You're gonna need a trigger so that you can control the power wirelessly. That's what I love about the Westcott strobes is that I can just wirelessly adjust them from the trigger. I remember back in the day, I had to go to my strobe and actually adjust it, then come back to my camera, take a shot, go back to my strobe and then adjust it. All of this is done wirelessly. You're gonna need some modifier of some sort, assuming you want some soft light. Now, of course you can use hard light, you can use bare flash, but for most of my work outdoors, I don't do that. Maybe in the studio, but that's a whole nother topic. And then of course, you're gonna need a stand to hold up your modifiers and your lights. The equipment that I'm using currently right now is the Westcott strobes. So they have a good uh, range of strobes. You have your 400 watt strobes, your 200 watts, and then you have your speed light. And some of my favorite modifiers, the two modifiers, if, if I can only have two modifiers with me at all times, would be the 24 inch Joel Grimes Beauty Dish and the Manny Ortiz uh, Beauty Dish. And the reason why I like those is that it offers that perfect blend between soft light and hard light. Uh, I used to be a big fan of always like getting like super soft light. And so recently I've been kind of getting more into a hard light, but also that nice little sweet spot that in between. One of the things that I like about the FJ400 strobe is that this strobe, you can actually charge and shoot with it in the studio. Uh, a lot of the times when I'm helping people that are local photographers, they're using strobes that have to be plugged in all the time. But then when they go outside, they have to take these battery packs with them or they can't even take them out. This strobe allows you to plug it in. You don't have to worry about the battery running out. And if you decide to go outside and you want it to be wireless, it comes with this awesome little uh, battery that's attached to the strobe. And this strobe is my do-it-all strobe, whether it's in the studio or outdoors. This is by far my favorite strobe. If you want something a little bit more portable, this is where an FJ200 comes into play. We'll talk about a little bit more about the FJ200 in a moment. Just want to emphasize that they are on sale. So if you want to save and if you've been wondering about the FJ200, you can get it for $50 off currently. And then they have a touchscreen speed light, which is very versatile, especially with the color gels that you can attach. And they have these awesome little magnets that you can attach here. So you can add all kinds of little small modifiers and such. So all those strobes have the ability to shoot high-speed sync, okay? And so no matter what strobe you get from Westcott, they all offer high-speed sync. But before we even get into high-speed sync, I wanna talk about, well, what the heck is it, okay? So high-speed sync, what this allows you to do is it allows you to sync your strobes to your camera when your shutter speed is, you can set your shutter speed faster than your flash sync speed. So let me say that one more time. If I'm shooting with maybe a Canon or a Sony, Canon, you're limited to your flash sync speed being 200th of a second. And on Sony, it's 250th of a second, okay? But if I wanna do shallow depth of field portraits, I have to use an ND filter in order for me to use that off-camera flash, or I'm gonna get a way overexposed image if I'm shooting at the you know, sunlight, okay? And so the purpose of using high-speed sync is that it allows you to use those shallow depth of field apertures to create effects like we see here. Subjects in focus, we get to blur out the background. So here's an example. Let's say that I wanna create shallow depth of field portraits, but I wanna use the flash sync speed. 
if I'm shooting in the bright sun, it's not going to happen. The only way that it's going to work is that if I use an ND filter. So you're going to get an overexposed image here. Once again, if I'm trying to create shallow depth of field portraits. What I would then have to do in order to get the ambient balanced out, I would then have to move my aperture to 5.6 if I'm still within the standard flashing speed of 250 of a second. Okay. And so when we increase it to 5.6, you'll notice that the background is a little bit more in focus, which in some instances, this is what you would want to do, 5.6, 7.1, f8. But in some situations, you might be in a, an environment where maybe you do want to blur out the background. Maybe there are a lot of distractions in the background. And so how would I do that? Well, this is where high-speed scene comes into play. Flash sync speed at 250th of a second, what you'll notice is the slow shutter speeds. What happens is the sensor is being exposed entirely for a brief moment, and the flash is being able to fire, and that's able to register on the entire photograph. If I increase the shutter speed, what ends up happening is the shutter curtain ends up blocking that strobe, and you'll see that a little bit of a portion gets blocked off by the shutter curtain. If I increase it even faster to 400, you'll see that the shutter speed is only showing a thin portion of that sensor, thus creating only the only bottom part of the image being revealed. So one of the ways to get around that is to use high-speed sync and enable it on your camera and on your, I'm sorry, on your trigger and your strobe. So the way high-speed sync works is that it fires off a sequence of flashes throughout the process of you shooting. So it'll go pop, pop, pop. So it fires maybe three or four times to fill up the entire sensor. So one thing I want to iterate is if you're using the Westcott um, ecosystem, you have something called a front curtain sync. And you have a button here called sync. And it's very similar to other strobes. So if you use a different brand, you'll have the same type of features. If you leave it on front curtain sync, you're gonna notice when you go to your camera, you're gonna be stuck at that flash sync speed of a 200th of a second. And I see this question on Instagram. I get this quite often. My strobe isn't going above 200th of a second on my shutter speed. And what they need to do is they need to enable high speed sync by clicking this little sync button. It unlocks that limitation of using 200th of a second. So if I wanted to use shutter speed 500, 1,000, 4,000, or even 8,000, you have to have high-speed sync enabled. Now, keep in mind that you can still create shallow depth of field portraits using off-camera flash without high-speed sync. So there are some advantages to these three different options that we have. If you decide to shoot with high-speed sync, understand that you're going to cut the power of your strobe by one or more stops. Because that flash is bursting off to fill the entire frame, it's having to work a little bit more. So instead of a 400 watt strobe, it's gonna maybe turn into a 250 watt strobe or a 200 watt strobe with high speed sync. Your strobes are gonna be a little bit larger if you want to really maximize that power. Some of the advantages of high speed sync is that it's relatively convenient. I don't have to buy extra ND filters and if you're like me, where I shoot indoors and outdoors, and I'm kind of all over the place, when I'm shooting, my brain is like, oh, I see this cool spot over there. I can just shoot at any time of the day, and I don't have to worry about taking off an ND filter. Now, if I use an ND filter, you have to buy it for a specific lens, right? So depending on what kind of lenses that you use, like me, in my set, I love a 35, a 50, and 85. Those are my three go-to primes. So I would have to maybe buy an ND filter for each of those lenses if I go with the lens ND filter. Or I could get the step up ring so that I can fit on them. And one of the negatives is that's an additional cost. You know, you buy your strobe and that's like, okay, well now I have to buy an ND filter. And so there's pros and cons to that. Now some of the advantages with these ND filters is that you can get the variable ND filters. So I can easily just switch it. I can go from a five stop to a six stop seven just by twisting it, which is really convenient. 
One of the reasons why you would want to use ND filters is to retain the maximum power output of your strobe. Because if I stay within the flash sync speed of 200 of a second, that flash only fires once, opposed to with high speed sync, having to go pop, 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 pop. It's just one flash. I keep all of that power output. One thing about the lens ND filters is that you don't have to expose the sensor. So on this next one that I'm going to show you, there are some sensor ND filters that you can put inside your mirrorless camera. So this is a fantastic option if you have multiple lenses. It's going to work with everything, even if you have those fisheye lenses like those 14 millimeters. As I mentioned, you get to retain the maximum power output of your strobe. Now, some of the negatives with this one is that if I put a six stop ND filter into my mirrorless camera over my sensor and I don't need six stops, I'm gonna have to increase my ISO. I might have to take out that ND filter if I decide to go shoot indoors. Now I was just shooting with my friend Reza in Ohio and I was telling him about these ND filters. And one of the negatives is that people are afraid of exposing their sensor and putting something over their sensor. So that's gonna be everybody's decision. I find it to be no issue at all, but just know that this option is available. If you're curious on how this sensor ND filter works, here's a little quick video. You'll see that the sensor or the ND filter just goes right over the sensor, push it down, it's relatively simple. And then you can attach, once again, any lens that you want, which is really convenient. So think about whatever style that you want. 90% of my work is with high-speed sync. From time to time, I will use ND filters but just know that there are three different options. Cause I know I did a presentation in Houston and they were talking about ND filters. So I wanted to make sure in this presentation, I didn't want to leave out this information. Here's an example of where I'm using ND filters and I'm going to explain why. So in this location, this is Sal del Rey and it's here relatively close to my area. I have to drive maybe about 30 minutes out. Now, when I went to this location, I had to walk about an, like a mile to get to this sp specific spot. And because it's a mile hike to get to this area, I didn't wanna bring a bigger strobe. I wanted to use something portable like an FJ200, but I wanted to make sure that I could maximize that full 200 watts of the FJ200 without getting into high-speed sync. Because once again, high-speed sync, you reduce the power output, you're gonna lose about a stop of light. So that's why when I did this photograph, I set up the ND filter in my a7 III and I simply use my FJ200 to capture this picture so I can maximize the full potential because I didn't want to bring uh, a bunch of you know, big strobes because I was going to be walking once again about a mile. So what is the best option? High-speed sync, the lens ND filters, or the sensor ND filters? It's gonna be up to you guys. There is no right or wrong here. It all depends on your style. I like to have all three options available to me um, because I do video, I do already have the ND filters already available for me. Um, so I use those. And then once again, if I run into a situation where I need to pack light and I wanna keep the full power of my strobe, I'm gonna then use one of these sensor ND filters. But just keep in mind, if you're going to use these ND filters, you're going to want to be on front curtain sync. You don't want it to set it to a uh, high speed sync. And once again, this retains your full power of your strobe. If you decide to go to the high speed sync route and you want to unlock that shutter speed and use whatever shutter speed you want, make sure that you have high speed sync enabled here. I want to recap real quick about the ND filters. This is your settings without an ND filter. So if I wanted to create shallow depth of field portraits at 1.4 and I have to stay within my flash sync speed, this is gonna be my exposure, which obviously is not gonna work. Then I would have to use my standard flash. I would have to compensate and adjust my aperture to get that light ambient correct. So go to 4.5. More depth of field means more things are gonna be in focus. And then if I go into high-speed sync, you'll see that I can get these faster shutter speeds like 6,500. And here's one last example. This is what it looks like before high-speed sync. 
And then to the right, you'll see after high speed sync. So now that we've gone over some of those technical stuff of the options that you have for off camera flash, now I wanna get into my camera settings. And all of this stuff is based on using high speed sync. So for my work, I shoot outdoors, of course. My ISO, I'm gonna set that to 100. And that's never gonna change unless I'm shooting blue hour, nighttime, or indoors. So for most of the time, I'm not adjusting my ISO. It really stays at 100 for most of the time. My settings on my camera and my strobe are both set to manual mode. My camera's not in AV mode or in shutter priority mode or in flower mode or in portrait mode. It's on manual. The strobe, I get this question quite often on Instagram, is are you using TTL? Are you using manual mode? 100% of the time, it's in manual mode. My aperture, because I love those shallow depth of field, and that's just my personal style, and that's my artistic choice. If you guys wanna use aperture four or 5.6, by all means, please do so. But for my style, most of the time, I start off at F2. And the reason why I shoot at F2 is that I still wanna be able to retain some focus on the face. If I'm shooting at 1.2, 1.4, that increases the risk of me losing some of that skin texture and that detail on the face. So a lot of my portraits, even though I have a 1.2 Sigma lens, I still shoot it at F2 or 2.8. Because sometimes I don't wanna blur out the background so much where you don't even know where the subject is, okay? So it all depends on the context of what you're shooting. So for the aperture, think about your artistic preference and you set that. Here's an example of where I'm using aperture 5.6. So I'm doing a client shoot. And when I do clients, they're specifically choosing locations that they wanna highlight. I don't wanna always blur out the background. And so in this case, we got a softball player here, Adiana. We're on the softball field. I don't wanna blur it out to smithereens. If I shot this at 1.2, we might not even be able to tell that she's in a baseball field, okay? So it's very important that you think about the context of what you're shooting. So once I have those two settings locked in, ISO 100, aperture 2.8 or lower, now all we need to figure out is what is gonna be our shutter speed. And our shutter speed is just gonna be based on the ambient that's available at the time of the at the time that we're shooting, whether it's cloudy, whether it's daytime, is it nighttime, blue hour? That's all gonna be dictated based on that. So here's an example. I have my aperture and my ISO already set in my camera. And as I increase my shutter speed, you're gonna notice the background ambient gets darker as I raise that shutter speed number. Now, deciding that number is gonna be an artistic choice. How bright or dark do you want your background to be? And this is where a lot of people get caught up. It's like, well, I don't know how dark or bright I want it to be. It's all about the message that you're trying to convey. Understand that the more, the darker you're gonna have it in the background, it's gonna be a little bit more dramatic. The brighter that you have it, it's gonna be a little bit more airy. It's gonna be a little bit more natural light, that light and airy look. So it all depends on the context. So one thing I wanna emphasize, here's another example. I have M standing there and what you'll see is I'm increasing that shutter speed. And I would say once I get to that 2000 mark, it starts to get too dark, at least for this specific shot. Right around 2000, 4000, I would say that I'm pushing it too much. And I would probably wanna be around the 800 to 1000 range with my shutter speed. Here's an example of nighttime. You'll see that because it's nighttime, look at how slow my shutter speed is now compared to where it was right now at maybe 2000. I'm at shutter speed 30, 40, or 50. So automatically, whenever I'm shooting, I already know if it's golden hour and I'm shooting in the bright sun, I already know my shutter speed is gonna probably be anywhere between 4,000 and 8,000. When I get into nighttime, I already know automatically it is gonna be at 250th and below. 
So step number one, you get your ambient exposure. Don't worry about the subject just yet. How dark or bright do you want that background to be? And you have to figure out that correct balance. Now with these mirrorless cameras now, it's so much easier. I remember with the DSLR days, I would have to put the camera up, take a shot, take a look at it, and then adjust my shutter speed, take a shot, and then redo it. Now with your mirrorless cameras, you see everything live now. You can just adjust it to your taste. Once you have your ambient exposure, this is where now you add your strobe light to fill light on the subject because when you do your ambient exposure, obviously the subject is not gonna be lit up. When I add my flash, now I'm in full control of sculpting the light on the subject. And that's one of the reasons why I love off camera flash is that I can create a three dimensional effect, but also sculpt the light the way I want, opposed to natural light where maybe you're not getting the quality of light that you want. And so here is a breakdown of this shot. I'm using the FJ200 and I'm using high speed sync. So if you're wondering, hmm, Eli, can I use the FJ200 and use high speed sync? Is it still gonna be powerful enough? Well, here it is. I can use it and I can still get high speed sync shots using this stroke, okay? I'm here at shutter speed 8,000th of a second. At the time of day that I shot this, this is, we're in bright sun conditions. This is around 4 p.m., 5 p.m. And so really bright outside. Now, one of the things that I do love about the FJ200, they do have this FJ100, FJ200 insert, which means that I can attach it to my Joel Grimes uh, beauty dish without having to use extra brackets and so forth. I can just use the tilter bracket that comes with the FJ200. So the shutter speed is that secret ingredient to capture those dramatic skies in camera and also to balance out the flash with the ambient. I wanna reiterate, get your background ambient first. That's part one. Part two is to add your fill flash. Now, when you're adding your fill flash, one of the general rules that I follow is the bottom of the modifier is typically around the shoulder level or eye level. And I like to tilt the light down ever so slightly. So you'll notice that there's a subtle tilt with this light pointing down. Okay, and if I want my photographs to not look so flashy, keep that light in the same direction as the sun. We're gonna get into that in a little bit, but if I keep that light in the same direction as the sun, it almost looks like the sun was lighting up the subject, okay? Now, one little bonus tips. One of my favorite C stands to use is Kupo. Big fan of Kupo. I used to use other C stands. They would always fall apart on me. I got frustrated and then decided to go Kupo and Kupo hasn't let me down. So if you're looking for a reliable C stand, go with Kupo. So the next thing is, well, the power output. Okay, Eli, I'm using high speed sync. I've already locked in my camera settings. I already got my modifier. I have it in place. This is, the, this is where people panic. O to the M to the G. How do I get my power output here? What do I do next, right? And so one of the things that you want to make sure is that you have your strobe and your trigger set to the correct channel. I'll see this question from time to time on Facebook groups where people are saying, my flash isn't firing. I just bought this new strobe. I'm learning off camera flash. And they open up the box and they think it's gonna work right out of the box. You have to verify that the channel on your trigger and the channel on your strobe is the same. So in this case, in this example that I'm showing you right now, it is channel 11. You also have to make sure that the group is also set to what you want to assign. So if I'm just working with one light, I have that on A. So you'll see right here, FJ200, it's on A. And on the trigger, I have it assigned and I'm adjusting the power. So if the channel is not correct, I'm not going to be able to adjust that power wirelessly. You're going to be stuck and you're going to be frustrated. So make sure that that channel is the correct channel. Once I have that set up, just understand that the higher your shutter speed is, this is just a general rule, the higher the power output that you're gonna need from your strobe. So here I have a nice little diagram for you that you can refer to. If you use a different brand of flash, I've even put the fractions for you. 
But there's so many variables that go into the power output. The distance that you have your light to the subject, the tilt, how much are you feathering the light? What modifier are you using? Are you using like a hard reflector? Are you using a 48 inch uh, soft box? But also what's your strobe watt power? Are you using an FJ400? Are you using an FJ200? Or are you trying to use speed lights for your portraits? So I can't give you, excuse me, a definitive answer for the power output, but you can use this as a general guideline. The goal though, is when you're doing your test shots is to look at how bright or dark your subject is. So here I have M standing and you'll see that at power nine, she's just way overexposed. And I remember when I was first using off-camera flash, this is where I would panic. I'd be like, um, and I would tell my friend Roland, or Francisco, I would be like, you know what, guys? Yeah, you go ahead and shoot. It's okay, guys. You're going to get some pictures that are overexposed. All you need to do is just slow down and just bring that power down. Even that power eight, that's still too bright. And right around power seven and six is where I want to be at. Okay? So do your test shots and just kind of get that correct balance. Now, I know one of the questions that I might get at the end of this uh, presentation is, Eli, do you use a light meter? And I don't use a light meter. With enough practice, and with enough kind of um, shooting, I've been able to just figure out a good starting point. Now, here's another general guideline that you can use as well. If you're shooting high-speed sync, if you know you're shooting midday, bright sun, or golden hour, you should be starting your power at power six and above. Don't even start at power two, okay? Because power three, two, and one, that's going to be for when you're in the shade or indoors or at night. I'm never at those power outputs when I'm at uh, bright conditions. So that helps me speed up the process, starting off around power six and then going from there. Keep in mind, when I'm balancing out my background ambient and I get my, my light on the subject, my background might still be a little bit overexposed. But I know my camera, I know my Sony camera or my Canon R5, I know the dynamic range of that, that I can reduce a little bit of the highlights to bring back some detail. And the same thing with the shadows. Sometimes I might shoot it a little bit darker than I would want. But I know that with Capture One or Lightroom, I can bring up the blacks and the shadows to bring back a little bit of that detail. So the ambient exposure, you have to think about what is your goal. If you look at a photographer like Matt Hernandez, you'll look at his backgrounds and you'll notice one trend. He crushes his backgrounds. He's going for a dramatic feel in his photographs. So he's purposely, with his shutter speed, making it extremely dark because that fits his style. So he loves these dramatic sports portraits. So it works for him. If we look at somebody like Danny Batista, he wants to make his photographs look more like natural light. It's almost as if you couldn't even tell that a flash was being used. His background ambient is very bright, okay? He doesn't wanna crush the background and go extremely dark like Matt Hernandez. And then you have Kyle Kong, where his photographs almost look like natural light, okay? He doesn't mind that his background is actually a little bit overexposed because he wants that light airy look on some of his photographs. So it's all about what you want as a photographer. Like I said, you are the artist here, you decide. When I'm shooting my client stuff, I try to stay on the brighter side on my backgrounds. I don't wanna darken up my background too much. I don't want it to be too moody because once again, some of the pictures, if it's a little bit too moody, it can be a little bit too dramatic for what I'm trying to convey, especially here with these graduation shoots. So I try to over brighten my background, even if it's a little bit overexposed, because once again, this is a graduation shoot. So it all depends on the context. Now that we've got a lot of the technical stuff out of the way with the strobes and the watt power and camera settings, now it's time to talk about where do we place this light? What are some general light positions that I can use to get awesome results? So there's two light patterns that I typically will use, which is butterfly lighting and Rembrandt. 
And then the two modifiers that I absolutely love, which is the Joel Graham's Beauty Dish and the Manny Ortiz Beauty Dish as well. So for butterfly lighting, if I'm shooting outdoors, I'll typically have a friend with a boom pole or a stand and they'll hold it right over the subject. And they're gonna place it above the subject angle down so that I get catch lights on the upper middle part of the eye. Now, what I love about this one is that it will always look good on your subject, assuming you get the right power output. But this also looks fantastic when you have a group of people because it spreads the light evenly. Everybody gets beautiful light all across. Now, if you don't want to have a boom or if you don't have somebody to help you hold it, because I know some people have to do shoots by themselves, Westcott has this awesome shorty extension arm that you can use. So what this does is that it offsets the stand so that I can stand right here and shoot right underneath the subject. And so this is what it looks like. And everybody that I've introduced this shorty arm extension loves it. It fits in my camera bag and I bring it along with me. And you'll see, here's a perfect example of how it works. You attach it to your C-stand. I've got questions about, what well, does it work with my C-stand? How does it work? It's just like a normal thing. You just go on, put it on top of your uh, light stand. It'll tighten and you just put your light on there and I'm able to shoot right underneath, which is really cool. Once again, you can use boom poles, but one of the issues with boom poles is that as your assistant's holding it, they're going to get tired. You know, and they're going to, the light quality is going to be a little bit inconsistent at times. So just understand that if you decide to do the boom route, that they might get a little exhausted over, over um, a period of time. Now, if you do like the boom route, because I, I do generally like the boom because you don't have those like legs that you have to deal with with a typical C stand. So B&H does have this. Uh, it's the Photo Flex Light Reach Plus. It's a fantastic uh, boom to use especially like if you're traveling or if you're in an area where you don't want to be uh, in the way. Like I remember, I think it was two years ago, I did a photo shoot in New York in Times Square. They don't allow C-stands there. So I had to use a boom like this so that I wasn't in the way of everybody walking through Times Square. My other light position is Rembrandt lighting, which is a modifier and lies about 45 degrees to the subject. And all I'm looking for is a triangle um, light on the unlit side of the face. So if we look at the subject here, all I'm looking for is this nice little triangle right about here. Now, what's great about this is that it creates some beautiful shadows, right, on the unlit side of the face. So it's going to make your image feel more dramatic. It's going to make it feel more three-dimensional. And so here, you'll see my friend David. He's holding the PhotoFlex Lightreach Plus. I'll never forget this day because this was the day that uh, I was uh, shooting with the Manny Ortiz Beauty Dish when it was first announced, but it was like 25 mile per hour winds. It was the, the windiest day that I've ever photographed. It was just crazy. Um, but yes, you'll see here, once again, bottom of the modifier, general rule, we'll get it about the shoulder level. Light is tilted so it can hit the subject and add some beautiful light on the subject. One of the things that I'm always looking for are the catch lights. The catch lights are very important. This adds dimension to the portrait. This adds life to the subject. Without the catch light, you run the risk of making your subject look a little bit dead. So you want to try your best to get those catch lights when possible. Now, one of the issues that might happen is if you're not getting the catch lights, typically you need to get the chin or the chins too far down. And you might tell your subject to lift up their chin a little bit, or you might need to lower your light. Now, one of the things that I like using in order to check if I got the catch lights is on my Sony and Canon camera, because I shoot Sony and I shoot Canon, there is an image review that I have set, and I put that setting for two seconds. So when I'm shooting off-camera flash, in other words, I'm able to get my camera, take a shot, and with the electronic viewfinder, the image pops up so I can see the sculpting of the light that I've created, but also the catch lights. Now, that auto review is not something that I have on when I shoot natural light because I don't want to be able to see the preview like that, but it works great when I'm using off-camera flash. Now, I want to show you this diagram really quick to show you about the placement of the light. If I have the light too low, what you're going to get is up lighting and it doesn't look flattering on the subject. The light's coming from down, up, doesn't look nice. 
This is where I have the bottom of the modifier around eye level, which is where we want to generally be. And then you'll notice when I put my modifier up too high, you start getting those raccoon eyes on the subject and you barely see the catch lights in the eyes. So this is something you want to be aware of, placing the bottom of the modifier too high up. So whenever I'm shooting, I'm always thinking about where I can position all of these lights, okay? So if I have my subject there standing and I think of this little circle, I have various different combinations that I can use to get a final photograph. So one thing I want you to do is if you're new to off-camera flash is practice. Place this light at the front, front left and left, behind the subject, back right, back left, and just learn how the shadows fall and how the light falls on your subject. So when I'm outside, you're in control of the light. You have to either find the good light or you have to create it. So in this example, what you'll see, this is kind of like my recipe quick guide here. If I have the sun, what I can do is I can use the sun as my natural rim light and get a two light effect. And I can place my modifier and light opposite of the sun. And this creates a two light effect, like I mentioned. So if I'm on location and I only bring one light with me, but I want to give the illusion of I'm using two lights, this is the light setup I go with. Now, one of the only issues with this setup is because the sun is coming in from this direction. Due to the physics of light, there should be no light coming in from this side. So be aware that this setup is going to look a little bit more artificial. But once again, it comes up to personal preference. This is one of my favorite photographs of all time. And I love it, even though I'm doing the sunlight um, as a rim light. Here's another example of where I'm using the sun. I have the sun back right. Sun's coming in, adding that natural rim light. And then we have the modifier opposite of the sun filling in the light on the subject. Now, what if you want natural looking results? You're like, Eli, I shoot natural light, man. And I really want my pictures to look natural. I don't want it to look artificial. Well, then keep your light source, your strobe in the same direction as the sun. So in this case, the sun is behind Daphne, camera right. Sun's coming through. It's adding this nice glow. It's also adding that nice hair light and nice edge light around the subject. And I keep the light to the right so that I can still preserve the shadows on the left side of the face. And here's another example. And we saw this image earlier where you'll see that the sun's placed to the right. I keep my modifier to the right as well because I wanna preserve these shadows and it gives me natural looking results. Now here's another natural look. Now this one's a little bit more complex, but here I have my subject, Javana. She is standing right in front of a doorway. So what I'm doing is I'm using the natural light as my key light. And I'm not using my strobe as a fill light. I'm using it as a rim light. So I'm using it right behind my subject to add this nice little hair light to the right. And then I noticed when I was capturing this picture that the background was just way too dark. It was just, it was, it was black. And I wanted to add it a little bit more color to the image. So what I did, this is at a coffee shop, by the way, I placed a strobe facing up with a CTO gel and it's pointed up at the ceiling to add this nice color at the very top. And here is the behind the scenes photograph. You'll see that I have my Westcott FJ400 with 36 inch octobox adding that nice little hair light and my strobe here pointing up to add some nice color. Now, if I'm shooting at night or maybe there's shade and I'm lacking a little bit of dimension, I love doing this cross lighting setup Maybe there's not sun that day, but I still want to add that nice rim light. I'll add two strobes opposite of one another. I'll set up my key light, which is about 45 degrees to the subject, either camera left or camera right. And opposite of that, I'll add another strobe. If I'm shooting night portraits, pretty much guaranteed that I'm going to be using this setup because without this little rim light, these pants would have fallen into this uh, background here and it would have blended in and we would have lost the shape 
of the body. And you'll see that there's nice little subtle details that it adds. So when you use these little rim lights behind the subject, you want to be very subtle with it. You don't want to get too crazy and have it set to a high power output where it's overpowering your key light. And here's another example of where I'm using the cross lighting technique. Here's another one where I'm using butterfly light setup. So I have the modifier relatively above the subject center. And then I have two lights behind the subject at 45 degrees. And I've attached some colored gels, a yellow and a red. And I'm using some atmospheric aerosol to just give it a little bit of like a smoke feel and kind of give it like a texture uh, to the background. So some of the things that I do before I, I go to my photo shoots, whether it's a client or whether it's working with the model, is I, I like to typically show up about 30 minutes early before the shoot if I can, when possible. Because I wanna set up my gear and my lighting. I want everything already set up. So when the subject gets there, I can just focus on the client or the subject. I'm not fiddling around with turning on my strobe, attaching my modifiers. I wanna be 100% present with my subject. Now, some of the tips to make your client or subject feel more relaxed is bring some music. That's usually the first thing I always ask them, what kind of music would you like to listen to? In Texas, it's 105 degrees right now. Please bring some water. I've been to photo shoots where I've been invited with another photographer and, excuse me, and they don't bring any water and everybody's dehydrated. I had to run across the store, the street to go get some water. So please bring some water. Your cart, there are some awesome carts that you can buy on Amazon, these extended carts where you can fit your modifiers, place your wardrobe, your camera bag. Um, you can't go wrong with having a cart in your photo shoots. And if possible, I like to walk around the location if time permits, where I can kind of get a general idea of where I'm gonna wanna shoot, just so that I can kind of work a little bit faster. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break down a couple of photographs and then we'll get into the Q&A. So here on this photograph, you'll see that I'm using a two light setup. I have my friend Marco back there. He has an FJ400 with a CTO gel to give the illusion that the sun is actually adding this nice glow. So this sun was being blocked off by this wall and these poles, but I still wanted to add a little bit of that orange glow. So I added an FJ400. Now, what's cool about the FJ400 is that it comes with this magnetic reflector. So with these magnets, you can attach these CTO gels or even colored gels, which is very convenient. One of the other things that I do when I'm shooting is that I'm always looking for areas with reflections. If I can look for reflected light, and that's what inspired this photograph here, is what I'm looking for is beautiful pockets of light from this reflection. And when I find it, then I set the base for my pose, which in this case, I told Jeanette to lean up against the wall. And then I added an FJ400 with the RapidBox Octa M. And that RapidBox Octa M, if you're looking for maybe your first modifier and you want something that's very versatile, the Octa M, because it's a 36 inch, I find to be a nice blend. It's not too big and it's not too small. And it gives you that nice balance. On this photograph here, this is a three light setup. You'll see that I have my key light with an FJ200 boomed right over my subject. And on this photograph, we were in a studio, it was dark. I wanted to get those vinyls in the background glowing. I wanted to add a little bit of color because I love color gels. So I added two lights to the background, 45 degrees aimed at the background. Now, Westcott does have this FJXR, and you can attach other strobes. So in this case, I was in Dallas. I only had two strobes with me, two Westcott strobes, an FJ400 and FJ200. And my friend Hector, he uses Godox. And so I was like, man, I really want a three-light setup. Well, with this FJXR, I was able to attach it to the FJ200, and I was still able to get a three-light setup. One thing I want to emphasize, going back to the shutter speed, you'll notice that I'm at a 60th of a second. Remember, when you're in low light situations, your shutter speed is going to be greatly reduced and it's going to come down a lot slower. 
On this photograph that we saw earlier, this is a three light setup. This is with the shorty arm extension and I have an FJ80 and an FJ200 and I have them set with blue gels. So when I'm doing night portraits, obviously everything gets kind of dark and muddy, can be kind of boring sometimes. So when possible, I like to add those beautiful colored gels. With the FJ200, it comes with this magnetic reflector. And so you can attach these colored gels that come with the kit and it'll connect automatically with those magnets, which is very convenient. The FJ80, they just released this creative pack where you can add those colored gels. And I told Westcott when they asked me, I was like, what do you want in this creative pack? I was like, you guys better add colored gels. OMG, we need them. And so they added, I think, eight or 10 different colors. There's a two light setup. This is, this is our cross lighting setup. You'll notice when I have my light source over here, camera right, I have Ashley over here holding an FJ400 with the diffusion that comes with the FJ400. Uh, but when I used it, you'll see that it's not very bright. And what I'm doing is that I'm using it to fill in those shadows. So without that FJ400, this side of the face would have been completely dark. And so I just wanted to fill it in ever so slightly. Now, whenever I'm setting up my subject for a picture, I try to set the base for my pose. So when I saw this little stairs, I figured I would sit Jeanette in that little area. And in order to make it feel more candid, I always tell my subject to look away from the camera. So whenever possible, look into the camera for a couple of shots, pop, pop, pop. And then I'll have them look away from the camera to just make it feel more candid. You'll see that my background ambient, I was at 6,400th of a second. I really loved these colors that we were getting in Texas. We get so lucky that we get some beautiful color out there from time to time. Here's a one light setup. I have the Rapid Box Octa M. I just talked about how versatile it is because it's not too big, not too small. But one little tip is if y'all don't have this app, whenever I find a location, and I'm gonna maybe shoot at that location two or three days from that date. There's an app called Sunseeker and it allows me to see where exactly the sun's gonna be falling. And I used to use this a lot when I used to do weddings, um, but if you feel that would be beneficial for you, definitely look it up. It should be available for iPhone and maybe Android, but worth, uh, worth every penny. I believe it's like maybe four or five bucks. I love it, great app. Here is a three light setup. So in this little warehouse that I was in, it was completely dark. And so I love off camera flash because I'm able to scope the light and create something out of nothing. So what I did is I placed a light source right behind my subject and I added a blue gel. And the reason why I added blue is because the subject's skin tone is orange. And if I use blue as my background color, already in camera, I get a complementary color scheme, okay? So think about your color choices when you're deciding what color gels you're gonna use. And as I mentioned, this is what it looks like when the FJ200, you connect it with a color gel. So I love it because it just makes it much more faster using color gels, especially at night. On this photograph, this is a night portrait. You'll see that for night portraits, my shutter speed is at a 60th of a second. And I'm using an umbrella. So umbrellas are very underrated. I know that people um, are not big, big fans of them, but they're very affordable and they can be really awesome uh, for portraits in the studio and even on location. So whenever I'm doing night portraits, I'm always thinking about the background color and ambient. So I'm always looking for areas back here so that we can add some nice color and some nice bokeh, but also got inspired by all of this red in the environment. This is the speaker that I use whenever I'm doing my portraits. So I just clip it, as you can see right here, to the stand, real nice and convenient. So here you'll see another cross lighting setup. If you do the cross lighting setup, understand that you don't have to use a modifier on it. So here I have my friend Marco, he's holding the FJ80 and it's just bare. And once again, just make sure that your power output is very subtle. You just wanna fill in those shadows ever so slightly 
and you don't want it to scream like, oh man, I'm using another uh, light source as my rim line. Here's another cross lighting setup. If you do like using modifiers, the strip box, Westcott sells a one by three. Those are fantastic for controlling and adding those nice edge and rim lights. If you do a lot of on location work, highly recommend that you all get a pop-up pod. This is fantastic. This is so that your subject or client can change if needed. So without having to go run and find a restroom or find um, have your subject go to their car and change in there, you can get this pop-up pod and makes it so much more easier uh, when your subject needs to change. One of the things that I'm looking for, if I know I'm just gonna blur the background to smithereens is I'm gonna look for a nice colorful background and look for something that's gonna add some nice bokeh to the background. And of course you'll see, because I'm shooting at the middle of the day, I'm at 8,000 shutter speed and I'm still using that umbrella. Once again, umbrellas can be very convenient in the studio and also on location. And so if you guys enjoyed this, and if you don't know, I do have a YouTube channel. You can search for me at Eli Infante. And also I'm on Instagram at Eli underscore Infante. If you are a part of the Westcott ecosystem, I highly recommend that you join the Facebook group. There you'll find a bunch of top pros, but also Westcott users. And it's a great group to connect with other photographers, but to also get some great feedback. So check that out on Facebook as well. And that concludes it. So now we're able to rock and roll with the q and I was right on time, man. You did, you did a great job. Thank right you. On, right on the money. I yeah. thought I thought actually that pop up pod was uh, was going to be for uh, New York City uh, rentals because <laughs> 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 they're they're getting steep over here. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, I, I want to thank you again first and foremost uh, for sharing all that information. That that was yes, a ton of great information. Uh, Q asked about if there's a replay available and. Um, there's so much to digest. So I did want to let everybody know that if you missed something or if you just want to go back and rewatch this in its entirety or break it down, pause it, stop it, digest things, uh, you could definitely do so. You can go to uh, vimeo.com slash BH event space. Um, you can go to our, our Facebook page, either the, the main BH photo Facebook page where it will be, or you could check us out, BH Event Space. It'll be up there as well. So you've got a variety of ways to rewatch it. And I definitely recommend it because um, just a, a ton of great things that were shared here. So um, thank you first and foremost for that. Thank you to Westcott for sponsoring it. Um, I, I want to start by saying, first of all, you know, we, we share something in common. You mentioned at the very, very beginning that you wake up at four, four thirty in the morning. Yes, <laughs> that, that is something I can. Uh, I'll, I'll use the word commiserate with because I also wake up at four o'clock in the morning. Finally, finally, somebody that wakes up. <laughs> My friend Marco is like, no, Roland, no, nobody wakes up that early, and everybody just laughs at me. <laughs> No, I, I get it. I get it. It's it, it's the time to do work. I, I go to the gym and that's when I get into the gym is four o'clock in the morning. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I spent the last several years of my life doing that. And uh, if, if you aren't doing that, you're, you're missing out on some peak hours. I'm, yes. I'm just going to let, uh, maybe we shouldn't tell people about this. Maybe <laughs> it's our little secret. Yes. No, for sure. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's get started. Elijah wanted to know, uh, can you please name the C stand and the brand of cart again? Um, I know the C stand you had mentioned was a Kupo C stand, but I, I missed the name of the cart. Okay. So it's the Kupo C stand and it's the low riser. The reason why I like the low riser is because in a lot of my work, you'll see that I like to have my subject sit on the ground. And so some of the traditional C stands will only go so low. And so that stand allows it to go even further down, which is really convenient. As far as the cart, you can just go on Amazon. I don't know if B&H has them, but you can just search up rolling cart um, and you'll be able to find some. The one that you do want to get is the extended rolling cart because they have your traditional size, which everybody used to have a few years ago. And then they released this new one that's even longer, which you can actually fit your C stands in there. And it's like, poof, you'll never go back to the standard size. So just make sure you find the extended one. Awesome. 
And I, I can I can comment that uh, we do sell carts at B and H. Um, some of them are kind of specific, so it depends on what you're looking for. But we do have a display in the store. I'm a big fan of the rock and rollers, um, but that's you know the whole movie and stuff like that. So, <laughs> uh, Ellen Ellen on Facebook wanted to know uh, she's going to be getting the FJ200 or FJ400 in the future. Right now, she's got an FJ80 speedlight and the trigger, and she's trying to determine. And I love this question because I always ask people and it's great to see what everybody feels about it, but uh, what's the best all around modifier to start with? Okay, so I mentioned that earlier, go with the 36 inch Westcott Rapidbox Octa M because it offers so much versatility. It's not too big, not too small. Now it all depends on also your workflow. If you're like, Eli, I, I really do desperately need a small modifier. You can't go wrong with the Rapid Box Octa S. It's also a great modifier as well, and it's very affordable. So, either of those two options, you'll be set. Awesome. Now, uh, Jay wanted to know uh, if you're putting a three stop ND filter on, uh, don't you still have to turn up your strobe three stops higher, or is that not the case? No, because that that's just related to the background ambient exposure. So remember that with if you stay within the standard flash sync speed, your flash is only firing once, which is, let's say, for example, 200 watt strobe, right? If it's only firing once, it's firing 200 watts. Now, if I'm with high speed sync, it's having to go pop, 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 pop. And so it's not 200 watts anymore because it's kind of dividing all of that power output through each of those uh, fires, okay? So there are some awesome videos. So if you guys go onto YouTube, there's two photographers that talk about this. If you want to go more in depth about ND filters, Rob Hall has some great information on using ND filters. And Francisco Hernandez, FJH, has also videos that talk about using ND filters. So if you're curious and you want to get a full breakdown, check those guys out on YouTube and they'll do a full breakdown. Awesome. Now, Pam wants to know uh, when you're using those lower shutter speeds, you know, at night or whatever they may be. Mm -hmm. Are you hand holding or are you, you shooting with a tripod? How, do you, how are you handling that? Uh, yeah, people are going to get mad at me for this, but I, I, <laughs> I, I, I hand hold. I know I should use a tripod, but I'm just, I, I don't know. I'm just too, I don't know. I, 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 it's just too much work for me to get the tripod and set up and slow down and move it up. Be, because with all these new mirrorless cameras, they ha all have image stabilization now that I just try my best. I lock my elbows, tuck them in, and I just shoot real slow and I'm able to not get um, any camera shake. Now keep in mind though, that the flash is actually freezing the subject. You don't have to worry about like motion blur. The flash is actually freezing the subject, okay? So you should be good. I wasn't expecting that, but I like the, but I like the <laughs> honesty there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so we got a, we got a technical question and, uh, I'll, I'll preface this by saying, uh, and, and this was asked by Aldo Andre, um, in case, in case Eli isn't able to answer this, he did mention about the Westcott, uh, Facebook group, which I, I know, you know, you're a part of, and I know, uh, JC, who is, uh, the, the Westcott mm -hmm. guy, um, you know, he's on there a lot. So if, if Eli's not able to, to, you know, answer this, you can, you can go there and potentially ask this, but uh, in terms of a technical question, uh, his Sony camera, he's got an A6100, which is working well in high speed sync okay. using FJ400. But when he, but when he tries to use it with the FJ400 and the FJ200, it does not work in high speed sync. Um, does it mean that it's an issue with the camera and it's unstable to do it? Or does he need to use an ND filter? What's kind of the work around there? I would have to look at the compatibility list. I know the FJX2M is compatible with certain lights. So if he cannot do high speed sync, he would have to go the ND filter route or at some point, I'm not telling him and recommending he go get another camera, but I'm sure at some point he might upgrade then that camera that he gets, it will probably have that compatibility. But I, I like your response, Scott. You know, I would ask in the Westcott uh, lighting group um, because there's probably somebody that has that camera that knows for sure. So I would just double check because I don't want to give you advice that's maybe not accurate. And so definitely ask in there. 
Yeah. And I'm not biased, but if you need a new camera, you know, B and H. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just throwing it out there. Just to, yeah. uh, now I, I hope I, I hope I don't mess up your name. I apologize if I do, but uh, per, Peritosh uh, asked, uh, how did you take photographs at 1 20th of a second at dark? What was the exact process to that? 1 20th at dark? At dark. That, that was the question that came in. Um, maybe you met one two hundredth of a second. Um, I'm, I'm okay. Gonna... So I, I, I did show a slide uh, for my night portrait. So I guess I'll just talk about like the exposure once again. So when I'm doing night portraits, I might increase my ISO a little bit, but let's just say I leave it at 100. I'm going to set my aperture to a shallow depth of field because when you shoot night portraits, you, you typically want to create some nice bokeh. So I like to use like an 85 millimeter lens, a 105, and set the aperture to like maybe 1.4, 1.8, f2. Really get that nice compression, get that nice bokeh. Because I'm shooting at night portraits, because there's not that much light coming around, right? There's no more sunlight. That's where I'm decreasing my shutter speed and looking at how dark or bright do I want my background to be. So if you refer back to this presentation after it's recorded, you'll see that I mentioned that at a 60th of a second, at 1 20th of a second, at 100th of a second, that's typically the shutter speeds that I'm using for these night portraits. And then if they're wondering, they might also be wondering like the question that we had earlier, my hand holding. Yes, I'm hand holding. I always get ripped apart on Instagram when I post a photo and I say that I'm not using a tripod. <laughs> it's, it's, it, you know what? It's, it's okay. They don't, they, they can't, the, the photos are great. So you know what? You can't, 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 can't please everybody. That's it. And everyone's going to be a critic at some point. Yeah. Uh, now, Mark on Facebook is asking, um, what density do you use for ND filters? Uh, six stops is usually the general rule. Uh, if I'm doing golden hour or midday portraits. Now, if I know that, yeah, it's going to be kind of bright, but I don't need six stops, then a four stop will be also good. But if you want to get a nice all around um, ND filter, six stops is fantastic. And B&H does sell those sensor uh, ND filters. I think they have a brand called Case, if I, if I pronounce that correct. Um, they do have that on B&H. Yes, yes. And, and so, so I'm assuming you're, you're not a huge fan of, of those variable density filters. Um, I, I love them for video. So like I mentioned earlier, I have all three options because there's times where I do want that variable ND filter for video, but you know, sometimes I'll put it on my lens and I'll shoot high speed sync. Like I was telling you guys, if you joined late, my friend Reza, when I was shooting in Ohio last week with Westcott, we were shooting in Toledo and he, he loves using those ND filters because he's one of those people who's like, bro, I am not going to get one of those sensor filters and put it over my sensor. I don't want to risk touching the sensor. I don't want to risk scratching it. I'm clumsy. He's like, it's cool. It's convenient, but I don't care. I want to use an ND filter and I can control it with just through the lens. So everybody's going to have a preference on what they want to use. There's no right or wrong. It's just up to you guys. What fits your style and what fits you. There you go. And I, I mean, I'm just going to take, I don't know many reses. Is that my buddy Reza Mal Maliari? <laughs> um you know what i don't even know his last name i don't know his last name okay. <laughs> is, he in, is he from seattle no 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 he's oh, a, okay. he's based in cincinnati ohio so, so maybe oh wow there's more than one reza there you go small world there you go I'm <laughs> all these reses this year. excellent <laughs> um so uh linda wanted to know uh i mean she said uh she's got two other brand strobes um she assumes you can use that you can use the same approach you're using with other brands just as fine. 100%. Absolutely. So if you're using any other brands, everything that I taught here all applies the same. Awesome. Now uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here from Osnar said, uh, can I get similar results using something like the FJ80 Speedlight instead of using just a strobe? Uh, if so, what do you recommend? If you're going to try to get dramatic portraits in the middle of the day, uh, man, you're really going to be pushing that FJ80. Um, you're going to have to, one, I would recommend not using high-speed scene, getting those ND filters. Um, but I honestly feel like you're not going to have that much versatility. You're going to have to pray and hope that it's a cloudy day that day. Because if you're working in bright sun and then you have an ND filter and you're just using an 80-watt strobe, it's probably not going to do it for you. Once again, this is talking about shooting outdoors in bright sun. 
I would be more comfortable with the FJ200. And if you're curious, you know, Eli, I want to use an FJ200. Can it really shoot in the bright sun? Go to the Westcott um, YouTube channel. I have some videos where I'm using the FJ200 in this bright Texas heat. And so I was able to use it, even using high-speed sync, even with some of that power reduction, I was still able to get some shots. So I would be more comfortable with the FJ200. And once again, bonus, it's on sale. So go grab one. There you go. Everybody likes a sale. There you go. Love a sale. Well, Eli, I want to thank you again for being here. A um, ton of great information. I want to remind everybody, I know I said it once we got to the beginning of the Q&A, um, if, you, if you saw something or you missed something, I definitely recommend re-watching this because there's a ton of information to digest. I think Eli did one of the best jobs, you know, I've seen at breaking down things like high speed sync and stuff like that. So, you know, you. definitely check it out. Um, want to thank our sponsors over at Westcott again. Thank you so much for setting this up for us, but that's all the time we have for now. Thanks for joining us, everybody. This has been another edition of the B and H virtual event space. We'll catch you next time.